looks like the ticker is slowed down. So I think that we can start with introductions. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, today we are going to be discovering the medicine, society, and culture concentration within the Master of Arts in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. Welcome. Very excited to have you all here today with us. So my name is Sam Hamilton and I'll let Dr. Leah Jeanette uh, introduce herself, but I'm here as more of like support role behind the scenes, all that kind of technical help and those types of things. Thanks, Sam. So I'm Dr. Leah Jeanette. I'm the Assistant Director of Education and a Senior Research Associate in the Department of Bioethics. Um, I actually fill many different roles, um, including um, a clinical ethicist at um, university hospitals, but um, my primary um, role is here in the Department of Bioethics at Case Western Reserve University. Um, I interact a lot with um, prospective students and um, teaching in the master's program. And so um, if you end up joining us, um, you will be very familiar with my name. You will interact with me quite a bit. Um, but we are so um, elated that you've joined us today to learn more about this concentration and uh, about bioethics and medical humanities as well. Um, so I am gonna just briefly cover our agenda. So we're gonna talk about Case Western Reserve and the School of Medicine. We're gonna talk about the masters in bioethics and medical humanities, but really more than that, we're gonna talk about the concentration um, of medicine, society and culture, and really what that is all about, because that is such a unique part of our program. We'll talk about Cleveland, Ohio, where we're located. And then we'll talk about application process and deadlines, student assistantships, and then leave room for Q&A. Speaking of Q&A, if you have any questions as we are going along, um, feel free to um, submit those um, through the Q&A feature. Um, Sam, do you wanna add any more about how they access, it, access the Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. If someone is on a desktop or a laptop, you're going to probably go down to the bottom of your screen and you're going to see two chat bubbles and it'll say Q&A. You'll click on that and then a pop-up window will show up. If you're on a mobile device or a tablet, typically there is on your right side of your device at the very top, there'll be three lines. You click that, it'll bring down some different drop-down options and you'll select Q&A from there. And then you can type your questions away and you can type those throughout the entire program so that way you don't have to wait until the very end. And depending on you know, what your question is, we may answer it right away or we may hold off until the end um, during the Q&A section as well. So I'd like to introduce um, our panelist, Dr. Eileen Anderson. She is the Director of Education in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. She's also um, an Associate Professor of Bioethics and our Director of the Medicine Society and Culture Concentration. And so we are delighted that she is here to talk about all these things. And I will let her further introduce herself and her background and the many different roles she fills within the Department of Bioethics and the greater university as well. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for joining us. Oh, thank you. It is such a delight and privilege to be here. I'm going to let you know, I seem to have a little tickle in my throat. I have been lecturing and facilitating conversation all day on bioethics, medical humanities, and social medicine. And uh, so I like can't get enough water today. So excuse me in advance. Um, if that uh, comes out. But I am so happy to talk about our medicine, society, and culture concentration, which is really our degree's deep dive into medical humanities, health humanities, social medicine, arts and medicine, and related fields. <clears throat> it's a tough, you know, it's a tough thing to put terminology on this widely interdisciplinary world that gets called medical humanities, health humanities, social medicine, um, again, you know, arts and medicine. Uh, we have so many, uh, well, medical social sciences. There are so many different terms. It's all the same world. And what we call it in our degree is MSC, Medicine, Society, and Culture. Our program is pretty unique in its depth and breadth across those different kinds of subfields in the social sciences, humanities, and arts. Um, as an individual scholar, 
I have been incredibly fortunate to have a widely diverse training that actually includes all three of those. Um, though I, my doctoral level training um, is, is really psychological and medical anthropology. Um, so my doctorate uh, is actually in human development and psychology. And I was a tenured professor of anthropology before I moved to the medical school um, to uh, create and run our programs in medicine, society, and culture. And this is a concentration. We'll talk about, uh, it's not the only concentration, so we'll talk about that later in the webinar, but it's a really wonderful, vibrant part of our MA in Bioethics and Medical Humanities, which is a, a one year or nine month if you're doing a typical intensive um, course of study degree at Case Western Reserve that is just fantastic. And we're going to both talk about the content of the concentration, um, as well as give you an overview of some of the unique aspects of this degree. So let's go ahead and advance on um, this degree and this program is situated within the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, which is a very highly ranked uh, school. It's a dynamic school. If you look at some of the subspecialties like value added in education, I believe it was actually third in the United States uh, last year. So it's a phenomenal dynamic uh, school. We in, at Case Western Reserve, we have eight different schools from a College of Arts and Sciences, business school, dental, nursing, medicine, engineering, etc. Um, so our program actually engages faculty from all eight schools. Just organically, the way that uh, Case Western Reserve and Cleveland have emerged, it's a very medical city. And so we happen to have this incredible bench strength across really almost every single department and all of the schools um, at the university have medical uh, specialties like our health law center, which we collaborate with closely was the, the first in the country and remains one of the strongest. So we, we get to benefit from that and have collaborations across the university and across the region, but we are housed at the very vibrant School of Medicine, which is our largest school at the university. So what are medical humanities and social medicine, and we should say, and related fields? Like, why do they matter, right? So it's been, it's been amazing, you know, talking about these questions kind of pre-pandemic and then during a pandemic, where in some ways they become intelligible. At some level, medical humanities and social medicine are the kind of non-biological aspects of health and healing and disease, illness, suffering, they are, they are people's meanings that it really investigating people's meanings around uh, illness and healing, um, investigating human behavior, right? So if we take this pandemic, there are certainly scientific questions that have to be asked and scientific discoveries um, to be made. But some of our biggest questions, like the meaning of a mask, do we wear a mask? Do we not wear a mask? When do we wear a mask? What's the meaning of social distance? What has been the impact of social isolation? How do we make decisions about vaccines, um, testing, etc.? All of these questions, how do we structure you know, educational institutions and, and keep things moving while also being very aware of a particular virus. Um, how do we allocate scarce resources like ventilators? All of those kinds of questions are, you know, they're not necessarily about the science. There are questions about people embedded in the context of their lives, embedded in value systems, and how do these emerge when we're talking about individual health, when we're talking about public health, 
when we're talking about policy level decisions or when we're talking about individual, you know, clinical decision making. So there, this is why the way we structure this is to understand some of the larger kind of economic, cultural, social, political um, co components that structure almost any experience of, you know, sickness or healing. And we also engage humanistic viewpoints um, of understanding histories, right? We learned and had precedence from other pandemics to learn how to best navigate this one, even though each one is different and happens at a different historical context. But whatever the public health guidance has been, for example, as old as written history, a subgroup of people have, have railed against it. Um, so we know that from historical data. Um, and we can look at understanding people's representations, maybe in literature or in film, which can communicate powerfully individual experiences, group level experiences, maybe what's at stake for someone who is tough for the power structure of biomedicine to really understand. So there, there are so many different components of um, our experiences of these kind of, you know, related to human health, healing, suffering, life, death, that we have to engage. And medical humanities and social medicine give us some really tried and true tools to be able to understand questions from global health patterns down to improving individual doctor-patient relationships, communication, and understanding. So, you know, these are some of the questions, you know, that I was mentioning that are not about, you know, what's the, the most cutting edge science. Although the most cutting edge science also brings us to questions about, should we be intervening? When should we be intervening? With whom should we be intervening? Can we ensure justice and respect for people in research and in clinical practice? Um, what kinds of values do inform and should inform our policy and practice? So these are the questions like really trying to identify, analyze, and resolve conflicts in values. We, we get a lot of tools from these fields to be able to do just that. We get the question a lot. Well, you know, this is a this is a kind of um, it's a wide field, although there really are some core like in the concentration. We teach a core seminar in medicine, society and culture where we deal with some of the biggest themes that structure experience, you know, across all kinds of realms, things like race, things like stigma, um, questions about sick role, some of these foundational con constructs that, um, you know, go through all these different disciplines. But what we are finding, this is a booming area in medicine and in the greater kind of healthcare world. Um, it is interprofessional and multidisciplinary in its origin and practice. And it is a great way um, for connection and collaboration. We are finding a hunger from medical schools, from healthcare organizations to want students who have, you know, kind of two things, the analytic capacity to say, okay, what kind of a problem am I looking at? What level in, of analysis do I need to bring on board to best address that problem? Now, which disciplines are going to give me the tools to be able to solve the problem? That's an extraordinary thing for a professional to have, and those are the kinds of skills that our students graduate with. So we have alum who go so many different places into clinical work, legal professions. We have people who launch into research and regulatory work um, with IRBs, et cetera. 
We have students who go into arts and humanities, maybe go on to do a, a terminal degree, a doctorate, an MFA, or go on to work in nonprofits or other sorts of organizations. We have students who become bioethicists, work in public health, um, and one of the things that we take pleasure in every single class is that sometimes students are coming out of an undergrad experience or maybe coming out of some professional experience, and they know they really care passionately about health care, but maybe they're not really sure they want to be a doctor or a nurse, and they're wondering, what other, what other professions could I do? And this program provides exposure and phenomenal discernment for people who aren't quite sure. I just had a mentoring discussion last week um, with a student who came into our program, not quite sure what she wanted for her next steps. And after her first semester, she became exposed to different kinds of careers through our foundations class and through her clinical rotations in a hospital that kind of reset the course of her um, career. And she, you know, has found a pathway that she's now applying into. And it, it was really beautiful. So we purposefully bring students into this program from lots of different backgrounds. We have this very intensive experience together. And then our students launch into all different kinds of career paths. So the way the and it is very exciting. We are one of the oldest um, master's programs. It, it used to be a master's in bioethics twenty six years ago, um, and we're one of the strongest. And we retooled um, the entire degree uh, in twenty sixteen to become a master's in bioethics and medical humanities. And that is also when we launched the concentration in medicine, society, and culture, which I should say historically now year over year, about half of our MA students will complete this concentration. So the MA, if you're engaged in it full time is two semesters. So it begins in the fall, fall semester, and then there's a spring semester. And then there are a couple of other options for enhancement as we come out of pandemic where people can add on a May term and study abroad. Um, we had an unusual opportunity last year to have a January term. So there's a little bit of flexibility in there, but for most students, it's two semesters, although there's flexibility to do things like complete it over 12 months or other, um, other ways that fit into people's individual lives and situations. So as you could imagine, with having a broad curriculum and a really exciting department, our department of bioethics, our core faculty who are based in the department are from all different fields. We have psychology, we have multiple anthropologists, we have uh, literature um, experts, we have bioethicists, we have physicians, we, we have um, philosophers, sociologists. It's just an incredibly interdisciplinary dynamic department. And then we have faculty affiliated with us, again, from all over the university um, and even beyond. So one of the things that's really important within this is personalized advising for each student. So students actually get a lot of advising before they even arrive on campus to, to think about who they might want to work with, who's a good fit for their advisor, what pathways they might want to choose. Um, then each student is matched with an advisor who is an expert in what they're interested in. Um, and as advisors, you know, we really work with students to kind of understand their career goals, to help choose their courses, to maybe think about other options for them if a student should really pursue an independent study, um, to think about how to make the most of their clinical hours. Um, each student will complete a capstone in the spring. So your advisor is there to kind of be a sounding board and help guide you to the right people and places to make the most out of this experience as you launch into your next step. 
So we have certain classes that are required of all students. But there are 13 and a half credits that are electives to customize your curriculum. So if you were doing a concentration, um, you know, a number of those would be your concentration electives. And, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what's in your core curriculum. Those are foundations classes. All of our students complete 160 hours of clinical ethics rotations across two clinical settings, usually a public hospital and a private hospital. We have close relationships with all four in our area by the university. Um, we have a number of short-term study abroad electives that we are expecting to be able to bring back online for next academic year. In addition to the Medicine, Society, and Culture concentration, we have another parallel concentration in research ethics. And um, something really unusual for a master's level program is we have competitive student ass assistantships that you can apply for to offset tuition. As one of these student assistants, I was working closely with one of my students today who is assisting me in teaching our undergraduate course that is an introduction to medical humanities and social medicine. Um, some of our assistants do uh, research with faculty, and I've even published with some of my student assistants. Um, so there are some, and some will help out in the program in various ways. So it's a really cool opportunity that both offsets tuition and uh, partial tuition, and it helps um, provide people professional experience. So you can inquire more about your particular situation. The earlier you apply for those, the better, because they are competitive and they are limited. We also have a number of dual degree programs that you can peruse on our website where you can complete um, our degree and another degree simultaneously, usually with some savings of credits and dollars. So for the concentration, in addition to our kind of course foundations course and your capstone and your clinical rotations, you would take the seminar I mentioned in the fall, Foundations of Medicine, Society, and Culture, that is co-taught by myself and medical historian Jonathan Sadowski, who is the associate director of the concentration. Um, that is, we have very carefully worked on that course. Um, and it is, it's a tremendous um, seminar introducing you to foundational literature and contemporary literature across these different fields. Um, and it is, it is a cool hybrid of faculty and student facilitation. Um, and I'm sure some of our current students would be happy to talk about it if you're interested in getting more information. Um, there is another 1.5 credit medicine, society, and cultural sem culture seminar that each student personalizes for themselves. And it really, in it's an intellectual engagement um, experience where you are maybe going to museums or hospitals or other departments or zooming in to relevant lectures around the world. And each student puts together their own kind of itinerary for that in a semester with approval and have a, a diverse array of intellectual experiences that you then reflect on um, for your final project. Then we've got tons of electives related to medicine, society, and culture. Um, as I said, all of our students do clinical rotations. However, in the spring, sometimes our, if you're going on to a clinical profession, you probably want to do your second clinical rotation. But some of our students have different career paths. They want to go on to a, recently we've had PhDs in sociology, anthropology, bioethics. And so maybe their practicum experience would be better suited in the spring to be part of a research uh, project and come out with a publishable paper. Or we've had students want to work with the homeless or work in public health or other kinds of specialties that you would work together with your advisor and with myself to craft an 80 hour spring practicum. We also have a monthly university wide and really a, a region wide reading group that our MSC concentrators participate in on all kinds of contemporary topics.
So for sake of time, I'm going to just uh, mention that these are our four hospital partners. Again, two of them private, Cleveland Clinic University Hospitals, two of them public, amazing Metro Health and uh, one of the largest VAs in the country. Um, three of these are with walkable from our department. Uh, Metro is a little bit of a drive. We carpool, et cetera. Um, and the the types of rotations that you get and then are precepted on are incredible. You, you know, you can read there some of the options. You may be in an emergency department. You may be in a burn unit. Metro Health provides um, health care for the county jail, and many of our students will visit there. Um, you may be in a pediatric unit. And Dr. Jeanette actually uh, oversees this course and your placements. And you can talk with her before you arrive about what some of your interests are. And she tries to match people up with hospitals that have the same specialty as you're interested in. But you're gonna get such a wide array of, of experiences you can't even imagine going in. Sometimes students are present to witness their first birth or or death or you know something you know <laughs> well in between um and you have opportunity to think about these analytically to look at the ethics involved and to reflect on them as the year goes on another part of our program that students tend to love are the travel courses that i mentioned um, with topics around public health women's health, death and dying, um, environmental ethics and human health, a real wide array. And again, I invite you to come to our website and look at some of the courses that we've had run in the past that we're optimistic we'll be running again next year. And those count as electives, by the way. I wish I had more time. I, I could go on for another half an hour just about how phenomenal Cleveland is. <laughs> Cleveland is an amazing city. It's a city that has, having is someone who lived on the East Coast and West Coast, um, it's a city that has so many of the things of a big city, like the largest theater district outside of New York City, world-class food, um, world-class orchestra, amazing sports. Um, what's not represented on here is last year, our Metro Park system was named um, best in the country. And we've got a national park not far away too. Incredible museums, world-class museums within walking distance of our department. Um, Little Italy is right there, great food, lots of different um, types of food all over the city. It's a very livable city, but you don't have the traffic of a coastal city. You don't have the expense of a coastal city. And lots of these amazing opportunities that we have are free or discounted to students with your student ID. Um, and you can look at that on the university website as well. So students coming in from all over the world and all over the country, sometimes Cleveland gets a bad um, stereotype, but students love it for the most part when they get there. You know, so we have to, you know, adapt to the snow. Today was particularly cold, but students tend to be really pleasantly surprised by how, how high their quality of life is when they're living in Cleveland. Dr. Jeanette, do you want to talk about the applications here? Sure, absolutely. So um, for a completed application package, we're looking at um, students submitting transcripts from undergrad and grad programs. Those can be unofficial for um, the application review and interview um, process. Um, we're asking students for a statement of purpose. That's one to two pages. Um, looking for your interest in bioethics and medical humanities and your interest in um, earning a master's degree. Um, and we're asking for a CV and resume, and then two letters of recommendation, including one from a faculty or former professor. And then once we have that completed application package, it's review the application is reviewed by one of our committee members, and then you're interviewed by someone who also is on the admissions committee. Um, typically, when we have a completed application package, a decision can be rendered within two to three weeks. We're a rolling application um, decision. So it's, we're constantly reviewing and making decisions and sending out um, 
those decisions. So it the turnover can be very quick. Um, so it you know it, it's a fairly um, streamlined process. Um, if you have more questions um, about these different materials, you know please reach out to us. We'll have an email address um, for you um, in just a second. Um, and then I'm happy to talk a little bit about the student assistantship. So these are opportunities, as um, Dr. Anderson mentioned, for students to be involved in research, teaching, administrative activities with faculty and staff in our department. Um, these are highly unusual to be offered in master's programs. Um, and so we are very um, committed to helping students um, you know, in ways that we can. And so these are um, partial tuition waivers, anywhere between three and $12,000. They are highly competitive. Um, and so if a student has submitted an application for the master's program, you then are eligible to submit a student assistantship. Um, these applications um, are gonna open either the end of January, beginning of February. We're in the midst of um, finishing that um, updated application and then um, the email will go out for anyone who submitted an application and as applications are submitted uh, in the coming weeks, you'll automatically get that email to start the um, student assistantship application. Um, and then in terms of deadlines, um, if you are a current, um, the next deadline is March 1st. This is for current Case Western Reserve undergrad students who are juniors who want to participate in the Integrated Graduate Studies Program. Um, for other students, our priority two deadline is May 15th. If you want to submit for the student assistantships on June 1, you need to get your um, application, your master's program application in by May 15th. It's really important. That'll give you enough time to get your student assistantship application in by June 1st. And then our final deadline um, in order to join us in August for the fall 2022 start is August 1st. Um, so that's kind of the big final deadline for um, this um, application cycle. So it's important to keep in mind. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to add them in the chat. I see um, that there's one um, asking if there's access to the recording for this meeting. We will absolutely be sending this recording out to anyone that's in attendance here. Um, you will get um, it emailed to you um, very quickly. So. Um, in a couple of days or so, you'll get an automatic email with the recording. And I really want to urge people, if you have more questions about, it, it, could this program be right for me? Is this program right for me? We, we want everybody to find a good fit for what their pathway is. This is, you know, it's a lot to talk about in a short time. C can I study what I'm interested in? Am I going to learn the following kinds of skills that I want to have before I go to medical school or my next step or get a job or whatever it is? You can please feel free to reach out to us um, at bioethics at case.edu. And we'd be happy to have conversations with you about your individual experience. Probably either um, Sam or Dr. Jeanette would see your email and make sure it gets to the right people who have the expertise in the areas you know, that you're particularly interested in, um, which may, may be them. <laughs> but we'd, we'd love, you know, it's a lot to try and figure out the whole nature of a program and, and if it's what you're looking for. So we're really here to help you kind of figure it out um, or expand upon things that you might have interest in that we glossed over. Or you might be wondering like, do we have classes in genetics and genomics or new technologies? You know, all of these kinds of questions. Um, we're, we're here um to try and help you figure it out and let you know you know more about what you can access as a master's student in bioethics and medical humanities at case western reserve well i'm not seeing any more questions so um i'll just wrap us up by saying thank you so much to everyone who's joined us we're so appreciative 
Yeah, thank you everyone. And if there are any questions, like both uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Jeanette mentioned, please send us an email. We'll be happy to help in any way that we can. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And hopefully we'll get to continue the conversation with some of you at least.